the Israeli people left Egypt 1,500 years B.C., and they went to the Promised Land. On their way, of course, they spent 40 years in the wilderness, and uh, most of that time at the foot of a mountain called Mount Sinai. Well, I received a copy of the Exodus Revealed, a VHS videotape, took it home, put it in my VCR, and as I began to watch it, I was absolutely amazed at the underwater camera that picked up on the sea floor dozens of chariot wheels and axles from ancient chariots. And uh, you've just got to see this. This is absolutely incredible. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me the Exodus Revealed. Mm. And J.R., I was ex as excited as you were uh, with this video. Uh, it's a video that traces the route of the Exodus, which has been, by the way, a subject of, of great discussion down through the years and, may I say, a lot of erroneous thinking. And J.R., the, the beauty of this, I believe, is that right now, uh, in what, I, what we believe are the end times, the, the Lord seems to be opening up some wisdom that was sealed heretofore. Uh, because not only does this video reveal uh, ongoing archaeological studies having to do with the path and the root of the Exodus, uh, showing, as J.R. mentioned, even the root of the Exodus across the bottom of the Red Sea, but uh, it talks about the location of Mount Sinai. And we're going to get into that. I'd like to begin by going to Genesis chapter 47. Uh, Joseph approached Pharaoh, and he had a request uh, for Pharaoh, and he asked Pharaoh if he would give the children of Israel a place to live in Egypt. And uh, Pharaoh replies in Genesis 47, 6, The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell in the land of Goshen. Let them dwell. And so it happened that the Israelites came to live for over 400 years in this land of Goshen. Well, you know, the interesting thing about it is there were only 70 of them. So the Pharaoh could be magnanimous, you know. Yes. Well, you know, it's not like he's going to give 1,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 people some property down in the fertile delta of the Nile in the land of Goshen. And so he offers, you know, for the 70. Well, over the years, they grew and multiplied until the then existing Pharaoh was somewhat upset that he had so many of these immigrants on his hands. Well, the interesting thing, Gary, is that uh, down near a, a little town of Cantier in the delta of the Nile, in 1966, an Austrian uh, team of archaeologists began digging at a place called Tel El Daba. And there they found the remains of ancient dwellings that look just like the ancient Hebrew dwellings in Israel. And uh, so they have concluded that these were the dwellings of the Hebrews mm -hmm. in the land of Goshen. And that land of Goshen, by the way, as J.R. mentioned, is in the Nile Delta, on the east uh, flank of the Nile Delta, and was choice bottomland. Now, what started out as 70 people, J.R., became at the time of the Exodus, according to Scripture, 600,000 men, really not counting family, just the men alone. So we're talking about uh, uh, a group of over a million, maybe a million and a half people who came, came out of Egypt during the time of the Exodus. And of course, we read about that in Exodus chapter uh, 12, uh, where the, the, the children of Israel are said to have left Ramses. 12.37 says, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. Now, J.R., this has led to a little erroneous thinking, because uh, Goshen was known as Ramses as the years went by. It was still Goshen, but it, it acquired the place name of Ramses, which has led a lot of people to believe that Ramses was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. That simply is not the case. Actually, the 18th dynasty saw a pharaoh by the name of Tutmosis I. And this 18th dynasty is interesting because there is a tomb 
uh, from the 18th dynasty existing in Israel to this day, and the pictures on the wall show slaves making bricks and a taskmaster holding a rod and an inscription that says, the rod is in my hand, be not idle. <laughs> so this pinpoints the Pharaoh who persecuted the Jews and made them into slaves. Right. Now, this uh, video we're talking about, the Exodus Revealed, documents the beginning of the journey at Goshen. And then it traces a very plausible route uh, across the Sinai Peninsula. And J.R., the interesting thing about this is that, that uh, the, the documentation in this video, they have gone to great lengths to make sure that each stage of that journey is historically and archaeologically documented. And then they make a case for the route of the Exodus, which I guarantee you is not what you have thought it was. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, in the year 1210, there was an Egyptian pharaoh by the name of Merneptah who made a military campaign and wrote a poem that, wherein he said, Israel is laid waste. So by the year 1210 B.C., we have proof that the Jews no longer live as slaves in Egypt, but now are living and occupying the land of Canaan, mm -hmm. or what the, the um, pharaoh called Israel. Yes. So there we have it. We know that there was an exodus somewhere during, that, uh, during those early years. And uh, here there is a cuneiform tablet at Tel Armana dating back to the early 14th century B.C., wherein a pharaoh by the name of Akhenakim was worried about the immigrants in his land whom he called the Aperu. Uh, Apiru is an ancient root word for Hebrew. As a matter of fact, it was the Egyptian way of trying to, to transliterate Hebrew into their language. Well, that sets the stage then for the Exodus. In other words, it's documented that they did live in Goshen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's documented that uh, they had uh, come to uh, Goshen from, uh, the, from the land of Canaan. It's documented that, that there was an interaction then between Goshen and Canaan. Now comes the root of the Exodus. <clears throat> and J.R., this is fascinating because there's an actual trade route across the Sinai Peninsula. It's well known. In fact, most of your Bible maps, if you look in the back of your Bible, will show that east-west trade route right across mm -hmm. the Sinai Peninsula. The northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. Yes. <laughs> and the fascinating thing here is that if you look at a map, and we'll put a map on the screen, and you see the land of Goshen, and then you see Midian, it's a, uh, and you put a ruler down, a straight shot, mm -hmm. you will cross the Gulf of Aqaba, not the Gulf of Suez, as most uh, maps in the backs of your Bibles indicate. Now, J.R. just used the, the word Midian. That brings up the next part of this uh, fascinating riddle. Uh, Midian. Midian is in Arabia. It's in what is today S uh, Saudi Arabia. It's on the west flank of Saudi Arabia, just adjacent to the Red Sea. Uh, and any of a dozen different maps will show that to you. And J.R., I love chapter 3 of Exodus. Uh, we're going to uh, deal with this uh, on two or three different levels. Chapter 3 of the, of the book of the Exodus uh, talks about Moses after he had fled from Egypt, after having murdered an Egyptian taskmaster, he fled across that trade route. And uh, it, it, we come to this. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. That's Midian, again, on, uh, not in the Sinai Peninsula. It's in Arabia. Uh, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And there we have, in one verse of the Bible, the location of Mount Horeb in Midian. In fact, there is an ancient city on the east shores of the Red Sea, or the Gulf of Aqaba, with the ancient name of Medion. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's Midian. And the modern name is Albad. And um, I want you to get this video. You know, let me, let me just take a moment here to tell you that we want to offer this to you for 1995 plus shipping and handling. If you'll call the phone number at the bottom of your screen or write to us at Prophecy in the News, 
Post Office Box 7000, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73153, and order this video. You will not only see the route that the, uh, that the Israelis took from the land of Goshen to the land of Midian, and you'll see pictures of Mount Sinai, the one in Saudi Arabia, and you will see the place of the crossing of the Red Sea, and an underwater camera as they went down to the sea floor and took pictures of dozens, dozens of chariot wheels, some still attached to the axle. I like in particular the one where it has an axle coming straight up out of the sea floor and about look like uh, four or five feet up, there is a tabletop wheel just as round as it can be sitting on top of that thing and others that where they lean down and the axle goes down at an angle, 45 degree angle into the sand. Just, Beautiful, you gotta see it. Just as you would expect if you were going down there scuba diving yourself. Uh, it, it, it's worth it uh, just to see these phenomenal pictures, but J.R., if you're a student of the Bible, this is gonna revolutionize the way you look at the work of God as he worked with Moses, because suddenly the Exodus begins to make a whole lot more sense uh, given this new perspective. We have, uh, in just to briefly summarize, and I'm sure that most of you know how the Exodus came about. Moses fled to the land of, of Midian. He lived there as a shepherd for 40 years. Uh, the Lord appeared to him at Mount Horeb, which uh, every contention now uh, would show us is in Midian. Uh, at the foot of Mount Horeb, he saw that burning bush. And the Lord said, you've got to go back now to Egypt and free your people. Well, to make a long story short, he did. And that freeing uh, that came about uh, began in the land of Goshen. J.R., usually the route of the Exodus uh, is, is said to have taken place in the crossing of one of the lakes on the east side of Egypt. There are yeah. about five of those lakes. There's one called Mansula, one called Timsa, there's one called the Great Bitter Lake, there's one called Lake Vala, and then the Gulf of Suez. And traditionally, scholars have said, well, the crossing must have taken place right there on the border of Egypt. Uh, but Gary, there are no mountains there to hem them in. <laughs> That's right. And the scripture tells us that they were at a place called uh, Pihahirot. Yeah. The, the mouth of the gorges. There are no gorges, uh, there are no mountains and uh, sheer cliffs on the other side. But Gary, fascinating thing about Mount Sinai is that the people who lived in the area, according to Josephus, said that God lived on that mountain. Could you turn over in Josephus and read us? This is absolutely incredible <coughs> that the people who lived there, when Moses first got there and married uh, Zipporah, uh, the people said, don't go out to that mountain. We never go there because God lives there. Now, Gary, there must have yeah. been something about that mountain that was awesome. Well, you know, the fascinating thing is, and, and Josephus writes this, and I'm reading Josephus book 2 and, and chapter 11, where Moses flees from, from uh, Egypt. He comes first, uh, and when he came to the city of Midian, or Maidaon, uh, which is the city that J.R. mentioned earlier, which lay upon the Red Sea and, and was so denominated from one of Abraham's sons by Keturah, he sat upon a certain well. Now, uh, the territory of Keturah was in Arabia. We know that. Yes, well, if the city of Madion was by the shore of the Red Sea, mm -hmm. we know it wasn't over there close to Egypt. It had to be over on the other side of the Sinai, what is called the Sinai Peninsula, uh, on the, the western shore of Saudi Arabia. Now, there Moses met a man <clears throat> called Raguel, uh, known in the Bible as Jethro. And uh, Josephus records the fact that, that Moses found favor in this man's eyes. He married into the family and he tended the sheep right there at Sinai. He drove his flocks 
thither to feed them, it says here in Josephus, uh, book 2, chapter 12. And Josephus says, Now this is the highest of all the mountains thereabout, and the best for pasturage, the herbage there being good, and it had not been before fed upon because of the opinion men had that God dwelt there, the shepherds not daring to ascend up to it. Uh, and here it was that a wonderful prod prodigy happened to Moses for a fire fed upon a thorn bush, and yet the green leaves and flowers continued untouched. And so there it is, J.R. Wow. Fascinating. Now this mountain, 15 miles east of the modern city of El Bad, which is the ancient Medion, uh, is 8,000 feet high. This video will show you this mountain and the top of it is completely blackened with fire yes. of some kind. We don't know what kind of fire, but the rocks are melted at the top of it. And uh, so you, you've just got to see this. Uh, in addition to seeing uh, the mountain of Sinai and the altar with pictographs of bulls, Egyptian bulls, or the golden calf, on the stones, still there to this day, uh, hmm. you can see the chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea. Let oh, me yeah. just mention it's 1995, plus shipping and handling. Call the phone number at the bottom of your screen, or you can write to us and order this tape at Prophecy in the News, P.O. Box 7000, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73153. Write or call today. Operators are standing by to take your order. You can use your Visa, MasterCard, uh, Discover, or American Express, and you can order this and see for yourself this absolutely incredible story of the Exodus revealed. Now, we're going to go into some of the details of that Exodus, but J.R., uh, there's something fascinating about the route of the Exodus across the Red Sea. Uh, there's very good documentary evidence that it didn't take place uh, down at the south end of the Red Sea, where uh, it, it narrows to a, a narrow uh, channel that opens out into the Indian Ocean. No, it was at, in the exact center of the Red Sea. And you know, J.R., the Bible speaks of Moses crossing the midst of the sea. Yes. And the sea is never called uh, a, a lake, or, or, uh, or, or it's never used, none, none of, the, the, of the names for a small body of water is ever applied. It's called a great deep. And so they crossed right in the middle of the Red Sea, and when they got over there, uh, they camped at a huge, huge area, uh, which is fascinating, and you'll see this in the video. There's a, a very large plain at the foot of the mountain. And Josephus says this, Moses talked to his people. When he had said this, he ascended up to Mount Sinai, which is the highest of all of the mountains that are in that country. It's not only very difficult to be ascended by men on account of its vast altitude, but because of the sharpness of its precipices also. Well, Moses went up there and the people said to themselves, you know, he's not coming back because we've heard from all the local people around here that God lives in that mountain, and, and it is forbidden for man to go up into that mountain. And the J.R., they just wrote him off. They said, he's not yeah. coming back. Yeah. So they built a golden calf. <laughs> right. Now, what we're saying here is, God lived there before Moses got there. Yes. And the people who lived in the area knew that God lived there. And uh, so it was, it was a, a, a gate to another dimension. It was a, a something really strange about that mountain. The people knew that deity lived on that mountain. Furthermore, Gary, when Elijah traveled down to that mountain, he went into a cave and a voice came and said, yeah. what are you doing here? And that was God. That was God again. And J.R., that's in uh, Book 8 of the Antiquities of the Jews by Josephus. Uh, book 8 and uh, ch Chapter 13 and Section 7. And uh, uh, it, it tells the story of Elijah being miraculously fed. And then he came to the mountain, which is called Sinai, where it is related that Moses received the laws from God. And finding there a certain hollow cave, he entered into it and continued to make his abode in it. J.R., while there, 
he heard a voice that told him to go outside. He went outside, he looked up at the mountain, and he saw fire there. Yeah, fire he, on the mountain. Fire on the mountain. Isn't Again. That amazing? That's incredible. It, it is. When Jesus went 40 days without food, it is believed that he went down to Mount Sinai, and after 40 days, the devil came to him. So there were other entities, other beings from the other side that also dwelt around that mountain as well. J.R., that's got to be an important meeting place. You know, you, you call it a gateway. I would say meeting place is something that, it's, it's a place that the Lord has selected uh, to meet man. And you know, today, at this time, and you'll see this in the video, at the foot of that mountain, to this day, there's a chain link fence that the Saudi Arabi Arabians have, have erected around the foot of that mountain with signs saying, no man trespass here. Uh, do they know something, J.R.? Well, you know, when Saul of Tarsus got converted at Damascus, he went down to Mount Sinai and lived for three years. In fact, Galatians chapter 1 says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before, but I went into Arabia. And so, uh, and then, of course, in the next chapter, he talks about Hagar uh, being typical of... Uh, Verse 24 of chapter 4, These are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Mm -hmm. So here he says that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. And Paul received his revelations, he got his theology straightened out, at Mount Sinai. So well, evidently well, you know, he it, had... Uh, he had conversations with God at Mount Sinai. It, it, it appears, and in fact, his magnum opus, sometimes called the Magna Carta of Grace, uh, is, the, is the book of Galatians. And, and J.R., he flatly says here in the 12th verse of the first chapter, for I neither received it, that is the gospel, of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. The clear implication is he went down to Arabia, to Mount Sinai, he lived there, uh, for a period approximating three years where he received direct revelation about grace, not law, but grace at the foot of Mount Horeb. <laughs> yes. Isn't that amazing? I tell you, you've got to see this video. Dr. Uh, Leonard Muller from Stockholm, Sweden, led the expedition uh, and uh, aboard a ship. They lowered a, an underwater camera mm -hmm and down into the uh, Gulf of Aqaba and took pictures of the chariot wheels that, were, that literally littered the bottom, all the way from one side to almost to the shores of Saudi Arabia. I mean, this entire eight-mile area is strewn with Egyptian chariot wheels and axles. Mm -hmm. And by the way, of importance to me, uh, on, when, I, when I look at a video, uh, one of the things that impresses me about any video is how well is it produced? Uh, do, do, is it well edited? Is it well photographed? And JR, I'm impressed with this video. It's very well put together. Yeah, it's, it's, as, it's as good as a Hollywood production. It really it is. It is a documentary. Uh, but uh, the music, the pictures, the, it's gorgeous. It is. And the quality of it is just magnificent. The underwater photography, it's just like you were down there yourself. Yeah. Now, speaking of the underwater photography, there's an element of this that you're going to see in this video that J.R. and I found extremely interesting. As you all know, having read about the Exodus, the Lord led the children of Israel out across Sinai um, uh, with a pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day, and he led them, and there's very ample evidence that he led them on this uh, eastbound trade route right across the center of Sinai. But then something uh, very interesting happened. Exodus chapter 14 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn, that is, they detour, mm -hmm. and encamp before Pihahirot between Migdal and the sea over against Baal Zephon, before it uh, ye shall encamp by the sea, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Now this is yeah. fascinating, J.R. So they left the trade route and traveled down a dry riverbed for 18 miles to the shore of the Red Sea. And this video shows it to you and tells you all about it. It's just 
phenomenal. And it, it even now, let me mention to you that you can get it for nineteen ninety five plus shipping and handling by calling the phone number at the bottom of your screen or writing to us at Prophecy in the News, P.O. Box 7000, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73153. I want you to get this video. And then, and this is the exciting part, I just have to include this, because this place called Piha Hirot, in the Hebrew, that means mouth of the gorges. If you follow this dry riverbed down to the shore of the Red Sea, you come to a very large sand-covered delta. It's like a huge beach. Uh, there's large enough to stage the, all of the children of Israel there, but that's it. That's as far as you go. You cannot go to the south, to the north. You're enclosed by mountains on both sides. Hemmed in. Hemmed in, totally. Uh, you have nothing in front of you but the sea, and the only way back is down that riverbed, and guess what? Pharaoh's troops are coming along the riverbed. Yeah. And it's interesting that the scripture says that Pharaoh had 600 chariots. Well, you know, they've got a lot of them still there after 3,400 years, encrusted in coral. Uh, but uh, in mm -hmm. fact, one of the chariot wheels, because of the metal alloy it was made with, silver and gold, doesn't have any coral growing on it. It's laying there right on the bottom of the sea floor, and they took pictures of it in this video. And speaking of pictures, this place, the staging area called in the Bible uh, in Exodus 14 to Piha he wrote, you will see photographs of this and, and you'll finally understand how it was that the Lord brought the children of Israel to a place where there was no way out except across the sea. It's mm -hmm. phenomenal. Now this dry riverbed had been dumping sand into the Red Sea for, I don't know, ever since creation probably. Uh -huh or ever since the flood of Noah, and it has made a shallow crossing um, that's sandy, and if you go to the north or to the south of it, you drop off to canyons deeper than the Grand Canyon, so there's no other place to cross right. except there. It's a fascinating, fascinating video. I hope you'll get it. I want you to have it. You've got to see the chariot wheels. This, this will make it absolutely worth your while. You'll want to bring in friends and show them. You'll want to send, uh, take it to your Sunday school class and show them. It's phenomenal. So call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and order the Exodus Reveal, 1995 plus shipping and handling. Gary, today's program I think has been one that I've been wanting to do ever since I saw this video. So write us today or call. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For your gift of $10, you can receive a special edition of our current program on audio tape, or for a gift of $20, we'll send you our programs on videotape. For either order, Call the 800 number on your screen right now.